quieter. So, hi, thank you for sticking uh, for the end of the day and this uh, talk. Uh, my name is Irina or Irena or Irina. It depends on how you can pronounce it. All work. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Damsky Tech. It's my own consulting company uh, that does uh, security, intelligence, training, research, and consulting. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, and uh, I'm also here to talk to you and to introduce you to Passive DNS. So uh, just before we begin, who here has never heard of Passive DNS? Okay, we have a few hands in the air. Who has used Passive DNS in the past? Okay, nice. So basically we're going to be talking about, we'll do a very quick recap of what DNS is. We'll introduce Passive DNS. We'll show a few basic queries that you can make with it, then a few ideas for research, and then we'll have a Q&A session with guest stars. So... Uh, as promised, unicorns and ponies all around. So part one, quick reminder, what is DNS? So the DNS is the domain name system, and uh, it was invented in 1983 by Paul Mokopitris. So it's not a domain name server, so when someone says domain name system, uh, DNS server, that's actually legitimate. Just saying. It's mainly port 53 traffic, although sometimes you'll see it in other ports. It's mainly on UDP, but although sometimes you'll see it on TCP. Uh, but for the scope of this talk, we'll just talk about 53 UDP. Um, basically, let, uh, a DNS resolution starts from a stub resolver on your device and goes to a recursive DNS server that goes to the root servers, asking them where your server is, where your domain is located, and so on and so on. So instead of trying to explain this, I'll just do an example. And so we'll do my script. Sorry, I don't really see what I'm writing. So basically, I'm trying to do Dig plus trace on Hackle U. So, yeah, no, my script is okay. It's, oh, yeah, it's not okay because I can't see what I'm writing, so sorry. Here? More? <laughs> hmm? Yes. No. Well, I did not sacrifice a go to the demo gods, so, and, yeah. Is that the end? Dot pi? No. <laughs> it's an interactive presentation. <laughs> I say, oh, yes. <laughs> so, now it works. Wonderful. So, when we're looking at this, basic, basically what you get to see is at first you have your server asking the root servers, what, where should you go? It's asking where the, are the LU servers located, and you get a list of all the L, uh, ser, re, all the root servers that point you to the LU servers, that point you to the name servers for HackLU, that will give you the records for HackLU. That's DNS trace. It works similarly to IP trace that we all know and love. And back here. So the most uh, common DNS records, the ones that are relevant to this talk, uh, are the A and quadruple A records that map you from a domain to an IP address, a CNAME, which is a canonical name, or a redirect, 
uh, NS, the name server record, MX for mails, PTR, which will be a reverse lookup for, from IP to the main and instead of the main to IP. Text, which is whatever you want it to be, it's a text. And RRSIG is the uh, DNS sec signature. The only reason I'm mentioning it here is because you see it and the clutter that you see between different ser servers, it's basically the uh, DNS sec signature. Um, there is a whole list of different DNS uh, records that you can look at on the Wikipedia. There are a few dozens of them. Uh, those are the most common ones. So that's DNS. Pretty simple. We all use it. We should know how it works. Uh, passive DNS. So it was uh, commonly agreed upon by people that it was invented in 2004 by Florian. And it's a, basically a historical database of DNS resolutions. So every time that someone does a resolution on a domain name, a DNS, a passive DNS sensor can record that information and store it in the database. It's collected using multiple servers or sensors on the internet and it's collected passively. So basically the passive DNS database does not issue its own requests. It does not issue its own queries on domains, but only records queries that someone else has already done. So if no one will access a domain, no, that domain will not appear in the database. Uh, another option of creating passive DNS is basically by scraping zone files. It's not that common. It's something that's available, but almost no one does that. And uh, it's very important to remember that since the data is collected using sensors, the location of the sensors matters. So if I have a sensor in Israel and someone else doesn't have a sensor in Israel, they will not get information from Israeli clients. So it very much impo uh, differs where your database sensors are located. So when you're going to query different DNS, uh, passive DNS uh, databases, you'll get different passive DNS results. Makes sense. Uh, you can get uh, passive DNS from multiple vendors, and this is a list of them. Uh, and um, some of them are commercial, some of them are research pro, and uh, you can get specifically data from those uh, different vendors. And uh, for example, NetLab will give you uh, data that is more uh, related to Chinese traffic because they are a Chinese vendor and most of their data is collected there. Um, VirusTotal builds their passive DNS database from uh, malware traffic. So the malware samples that are uploaded to VirusTotal, uh, when they're executed in the uh, virtual machines, they communicate with different servers, and that data will appear in the passive DNS. So it's already a skewed passive DNS towards malware. So it's a different uh, interest. There is also another passive DNS source that's not mentioned on this uh, um, on this uh, slide, since it's not that public, but there are other sources that are available. So uh, the slides will be available later, so you'll get the links to where you can find them, buy them, or apply for access. Um, I think that that's the basics of what passive DNS is, so let's just do a few examples. If I'm trying to understand what is the uh, IP address, for a, a domain, I can do that with dig and understand what the IP address the domain uses now. But if I want to know what other IP addresses were used by this domain in the past, the only way that I'll be able to do that is using passive DNS data. So if we we'll look at this, and this time it's hopefully going to be a bit easier for me. My script, dig plus short on hack OU. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Boom. So basically the IP address for hack OU is 188, 65, 220, uh, and 925. That's the current IP address right now. If we want to see the address for that it used in the past, or all the addresses it used in the past, we can run the 
We can run DNS. So the examples I'm going to be showing are using the DNSDB query and the data set from uh, Farsight because I have access to that data set. Uh, this script is available on GitHub. There are other tools that are available and are better, uh, but this is the one that I've been using for a while, so it's easier for me to use at the moment. So our set on hack OU. I probably meant yes. So. I did mean to do this. So when I run this query, I basically get all the records that have been recorded for HackleU in the past, and I see all kinds of different records. I see text records, I see name server records, I see SOAR records, and so on. So if I just want to see the A records, the IP records, I'm just going to limit this to slash A, and then I'm going to get the IPs. and I'll get two different IP addresses. I'm getting uh, the IP address that ends in 20, uh, 217.78 that was used between 2010 and 2016, and I'm getting the address that ends in 220.25 that is the current address that has been in use since 2016. So I would have not gotten the older address without passive DNS. Simple. So. If you want to get historical data, then you need passive. Another thing that you cannot do without passive DNS, or you can, but it uh, will require you to do it with brute force, is getting the subdomains for a specific domain. So right now, if you want to do a pen testing or an evaluation of some domain, you need to query the different databases or uh, and get the data from passive to get it. So in passive, what I can do is basically, um, I'm going to add at the beginning of the domain. So one more, thank you. Okay. Uh, no? no. Well, it's it's going to work like this as well, I think. Um, yeah. So if I'm just going to say, please give me all the records that have something before HackLU, I will get a, diff a list of the different domains that were uh, recorded in passive DNS throughout the years. Just to make it a little bit easier to see, I'm also going to do a grep minus V so to remove the comments. I'm on a new command, sorry. I'm so sorry about the technical issues. Um, grep minus V to remove the comments. Then I'm going to do cut to get the first field and delimiter space. Sort unique. And these are all the domains that are subdomained by HackleU. So usually when you do brute forcing or a dictionary uh, analysis of a domain, you will not have stuff like Hackathon or, or well, yeah, Hackathon, because the, the rest of them actually makes more sense in uh, regular websites, right? So um, that's something that you will need to create a passive DNS database query for. Uh, another thing that will make, uh, is possible for you to search for in, uh, in this case, is if you're trying to find stuff that is uh, your brand, but with a different TLD. So someone is trying to um, pretend that they are you or steal your brand or impersonate you. So. I'm not going to do it on HackleU because I, I, I assume that there are quite a lot of websites that are hack.something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this on Microsoft dot something, and I'm also going to grab only the A records. And still, in this case, we're going to get a few hundred uh, or even thousand domains 
that are uh, starting with the word Microsoft and then you're getting different uh, domains and uh, en domain endings. So specifically, I should have probably limited this for the past 24 hours because if you don't do that, it takes quite a lot of time. So we will do that in a second. <laughs> After. Yeah. So it's going to be a little bit faster than the original query that I started. Uh, usually in 24 hours, there are about 7,500 different domains. Uh, yeah, 7,500 different domains that start with the word Microsoft. As you can assume, most of them are not Microsoft related. Uh, most of them are some sort of uh, scam that's uh, using Microsoft as a sub label. So. We'll see it in a second once it finishes. I'm sorry. Internet connections are fun. Yeah, it's a big query. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, have you been enjoying the conference so far? Do you come here often? <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to show you that I have a slide for this. I did not just decide to run a query in the background, but I actually had a slide for it with the... Uh, I, so... While this runs, we'll continue. And um, so some of the stuff that we can do is actually, so we can do some research. So for example, we can find malicious domains or scam domains or do some uh, phishing analysis. And to do that, we can start a, a, again from a keyword that we will want to begin with. So it could be Bank of America or Apple ID or Microsoft as an example that we've already started with. Uh, and once you start from one of those words, you already have a data set that's uh, interesting enough to be potentially related to phishing or some sort of uh, malicious scam. So since this is a pretty long query, usually you want to limit it to one week or one day. And um, we've seen why. And... Um, one of the limitations that are also a limitation in this case is that you should probably use a joker only on the left or the right side. So um, you could do it in on both sides, not on specifically in this tool by the uh, by uh, the DNS DB query, but there are other DNS database passive DNS databases that will allow that, and it will actually be a much much longer query than even the one that we're running right now. Because if you're running a joker on both sides, that's unindexable, indexable. So uh, you would like to run that uh, data and uh, run some filtering on it. And we've got results. Amazing. So you would probably, uh, even from here, you can see that some of the uh, domains that we have, for example, this one over here, Microsoft ZA apps, whatever, it doesn't seem like a legitimate domain to be uh, in the internet. Uh, not to mention other stuff. Yeah, so Microsoft XP mode download for Windows 7 driver fix for Windows7.com. It does not sound like a legitimate website. But, but it's, it, it might only be my uh, perception of what is a legitimate website. Um, 
So uh, you can play uh, with the stuff that you've grabbed from here. And you can, uh, again, grab and filter on other things in this type of uh, output. So for example, there are things that should never exist in domains. Uh, again, those are my personal assumptions, so you can argue with me. But I do not believe that any domain should ever con have a label that says .com-something. So if I have a domain that's, uh, that the domain goes Microsoft.com-maliciouswebsite.something.com, it, it makes me queasy because it makes me feel that someone is really, really trying to make the person who's looking at that domain uh, wonder why is he, like, it's, it's, that domain is there just to confuse people. There is nothing, no other reason to have a .com dash domain in, in any normal circumstances. So if you uh, filter your uh, uh, domains on that, if you filter your domains on, for example, uh, combinations between ASCII letters and non-ASCII letters, that's something that's usually not a uh, common thing to happen on uh, in domains. It's more common in uh, domains that are in the Far East. So, for example, in Japan, you'll have Japanese characters and uh, Latin characters on the same domain name, but it's not common to have uh, French letters within a English domain. So for example, if you have the E with the apostrophe on top or with the thingy on top inside of an eBay, it's a definite homoglyph that's there only to confuse people. So if you suddenly see a Microsoft with an O with two dots on top or an I with the two dots on top, like the naive I, that's something that shouldn't be happening. So those things, are, you can, again, look for them in the passive DNS and find those types of typo squats. You can look for typo squats that are a little bit easier, stuff like VV that's used instead of a W, or an RN that's used instead of an M. So all of those things, again, they're there to confuse people, and when you look at it quickly, you might not even notice this. So on these domains, you can also try and filter on stuff like suspicious TLDs. So domains that are, uh, so uh, yeah, FQDNs that are registered under .preview and uh, start with Microsoft.com are usually not Microsoft.com domains. Those are domains that are in most cases, and I've analyzed quite a few of those domains, are all malicious and are used in different scams. Um, so, just saying, uh, highly subdomain stuff. If you have domains that have more than four sublabels, it's it it just doesn't work. If you have so if you have a, my, a domain dot com and then you have one subdomain under that domain, that is something that is very common. If you have two, that's not very common already. It's not something that people use in normal life. If you have more than five, that's like really on the malicious side. The, more, the ones that have more than 10 are, fall into one of two categories. It's either I've never seen this not to be malicious or it's someone wrote a script and it failed. So uh, usually if you try to, uh, and I'm not going to do this because it's taking a quite a lot of time to do the demo and the script to run it, So, but if you uh, count the number of labels within a domain and you only look at the ones that have more than seven labels, for example, those are probably all of them going to be malicious. Um, then, again, as I said, you can grab for .com in the middle of the domain name, or you can grab for .com dash, or other TLDs and stuff like that. Uh, uh, suspicious TLDs like XYZ or Preview or stuff like that that are more prone to be malicious. So .com and .org are more regulated. Some of the uh, CCTLDs, some of the uh, top-level domains that belong to countries are relatively clean. Some are, they seem to only exist for malware, like for example the .cc 
uh, TLD. It's actually a country code. It's a country code for the Cocos Island. And I've never seen a legitimate domain that's registered in that TLD. I know that it's me that's wrong in this case because there are legitimate domains there, but I've never seen them in any logs that come from actual users. So, yeah. So, as I said, there are a lot of different things that you can filter on those domains and then you can get a lot of interesting information from it. Um, another example that you can uh, search using passive DNS and it will save you a lot of time. So, if you're looking at uh, malware that uses DGAs, so DGAs, domain generation algorithms, are malwares that generate a big list of or a large list of domains on a daily basis usually, and then only one or two of those domains are actually registered by the malicious actors uh, to communicate with the malware samples themselves. So a lot of time, those domains are changed on a daily basis. To block those domains in your DNS firewall or in your infrastructure within your organization, you'll need to reverse engineer the malware figure out all the domains that will be created on a daily basis, and then you'll have to introduce all of those domains for today, yesterday, and tomorrow into your rules to block them. So instead of doing that, you could uh, for, uh, follow up for a few days on the domains that are actually resolved, find out what the name servers are actually uh, used by those uh, domains, and then you can block those name servers from being uh, contacted by machines within your network. So uh, that will help you because instead of blocking hundreds and thousands of domains, you can actually block one, two, or maybe four different name servers. Uh, if you'll actually do a reverse query on a name server, you'll see that uh, a lot of times you'll see multiple malicious uh, DGA domains that belong to that name server after you found it from an initial DGA uh, domain. So um, again, I could do this example. I am kind of don't want to do it because it's going to take quite a lot of time and um, I'm sorry, I don't want to waste all of your lives. But uh, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite a few people who has been working on passive DNS for uh, a long time. And uh, we can do some questions and, like, uh, and see what you, yeah, just Q&A on passive DNS. I'm sorry, this was supposed to be a more interactive presentation, unfortunately. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was not always you get to tell the presenter where he needs to print stuff, so. So I, I would be really happy if uh, Aaron, Alexander, and Paul will join me on stage. Um, so, again. I want the screen. Yes, we have a microphone, and um, you, uh, if anyone has a question, we'll be happy to. Oh, good. Hey, look at that. Yeah, we'll be happy to have your questions. So, and since since my system, is this on? since my system was used, I think I should show you uh, sort of why it takes so long, which is that the answer is large. Um, there, there's a lot to say. Uh, you generally want your, if you're going to get a large answer, you don't want to be on a Wi-Fi network at a conference. You want to be in a data center somewhere with fast, fast connections. Um, and then the uh, thing you were mentioning about the NS pivot is interesting. So, uh, by the way, this is DNSDBQ. This is a C program that I wrote, but have no fear. It's been audited by others. Um, that is, in my opinion, better than the old Python script that uh, people have used. And I have ported it to Circle. Um, and there are some things that don't work yet. We need to talk about that and, and, and yours. Um, but it's open source, so I'm actually counting on you guys to be uh, pitching in here. Um, so what's a pivot that you would have done? So what I would have done, I would the example I would have done is I would have grabbed a IP address 
from uh, John Bambanak's feeds for malware and uh, DGA malwares. So I would have grabbed a domain feed. So let's say AAKA. -A AAKA. -A M -E -M? M -E -N com. That's a domain that was used by Banjori Malware in the past 24 hours as a, DG, uh, as a CNC server for, uh, the, for it. All right, let me uh, clear the screen and run that again. Can you read this or should I use a larger font? Is this okay? All right. So uh, you can see in this particular tool it doesn't try and sort. That's one of the reasons it seems faster is that it doesn't store and forward everything you did while it sorts it. Uh, but you can see that the name servers have moved around a bit. Um, you can also see that the .com bailiwick has one report and the uh, act com has another report, because there are NS records above you and at the apex of your zone. They're, they happen to be the same in this case, but they need, no, 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 they're not. Look at this, NS2 and POSCI versus NS2 and NS. So here's an example of somebody who's probably hoping that you will be confused by the fact that they didn't advertise the same name servers above and below. But this ns2.vshosting.cz is interesting. So... Dash R is the way to get this tool to ask a question starting from the left. But if you want to ask a question starting from the right, you say dash N. So it would be ns2.vshosting.cz. Huh? And I only want to see that where it's used as a name server. Um, and so what you get from the system is a list of all the other names that have used that name server. Now, in that particular case, it was an ISP's name server, and so you're seeing the ISP's other customers. Uh, the bad guys are onto us, it seems. Uh, they, they've decided that if we're going to pivot on name servers, they're going to hide in a crowd. Uh, but I did want to show you those couple of demos uh, because I can read my you, screen. If you go back to this one, then you'll see that one of the name servers that it's using is ns. Okay, ns dot, all right, let's pivot on that one. Fairly often, if it's got its own name in the ns record, yeah, it was a so, bespoke name server yeah. and uh, will not be usable as a pivot. Um, Unfortunately, but a lot of times what happens in, sorry, a lot of times what happens in this case is that the name server that is used by the DGA is actually uh you, was used by a lot of other domain names by, by that DGA. And this is uh, happening because it's actually much harder, I'm sorry about the sound, it's much harder for uh, uh, threat actors to change the infrastructure behind the malware. It's easy to change a domain name, it's harder to change an IP address, and it's much even much harder to change the infrastructure that you're using to register the domain names or to change the name servers that you're using. So uh, when you're uh, trying to pivot that way, it will actually give you quite a lot of information about malicious actors. Again, e the malicious actors might adapt to that technique, and they a lot of times will use uh, name servers that are more popular, and they have a lot of different uh, domains on them. But uh, in many cases, and in many malware families, that actually works to block the name servers that way. So, again, the, I have not sacrificed the goat today, so um, unfortunately the mm -hmm. example we chose was not a very good one. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Paul. <laughs> what? So, um, yeah, is this working? So maybe, maybe I'll add some a few things. So what uh, Paul just said, uh, showed uh, the, the tool um, is basically... Um, uh, result of some discussions that we had about um, Harmony, because there, as you saw, there are many different passive DNS servers in in, in the world, and um, some are uh, more internal, some are uh, more publicly available. Um, but uh, we converged on a common output format, which is um, uh, written by us, um, and that basically allows the tool. And yes, Paul, I still have to fix mine, sorry. Uh, but basically, you can query multiple Passive DNS servers, uh, get the results, and uh, see also from the from the different uh, areas of the world um, that these uh, servers cover uh, what the view is, which is also sometimes very interesting because um, 
what we often forget is DNS is actually uh, quite local sometimes. Um, so let me give you um, a story, a little bit, a brief story. When you remember when Egypt went offline, um, I had a question. Um, my question was, what ripple effects will that have? Because name servers in Egyptian IP space are now both name servers are offline, therefore which domains are not reachable, even though they might be hosted, let's say, in the US. Uh, so that was an interesting research question, uh, which was answerable uh, with that, to some extent, of course. Also, I don't know if you mentioned that, or it's more, it's more implicit. Again, the passive DNS technique uh, is an opportunistic view of DNS. It's not the complete picture, of course. It's what's seen on the wire. Uh, but so don't don't assume it's a complete picture, but still it's extremely useful. And I think the very large databases here, especially looking at Paul and Alexander, um, and uh, these are very useful. So I think that's what I wanted to add here. Yeah, and and yeah, I, I'd also add to that that a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, when you're looking at different databases, you get different geographies and different information from the people who's under the sensors that are collecting for that specific database. But on, on top of that, if in, no one actually access the website, no, we will not see that. And it's, it's, it's a question. If I've registered a website and no one ever surfed to that website, does it exist? So in our database, we import zone files from everywhere that allows them to, to be exported. Uh, but we mark those as having been seen as in zone files so that they don't appear to have been active on the wire. Um, this is the Java uh, example, or not Java, JavaScript, Java, no, JSON. Um, so the JSON is the native output of the server and it gets converted by the tool. So if you're tired of running awk to tear DNS results apart, as uh, Irina was doing, uh, your, your code is going to speak JSON and uh, will do whatever you want with it. This common or output format has been in production now. We've been working on it for three or four years. Uh, there's an internet draft um, that has been stuck for a long time because we don't talk enough. Uh, there is a. I already told them. There is a special to, interest to group at uh, first, where uh, perhaps at the annual meeting in uh, in Scotland we will appear and give a status report, and hopefully the status is that the RFC has been published. Uh, but this schema, this JSON schema, was originally uh, developed by Robert Edmonds, who developed the first passive DNS database for Farsight. Uh, based on a lot of work that was done by Florian Weimer, who was mentioned earlier. Um, but I just want to say this, uh, it works better if you can use one tool to access all the systems that you want to access instead of saying, oh, it's that guy's, I have to use a web page and scrape it. No, don't do that. Uh, but even though that works better, don't let that tempt you to put the results in a blender. There are people out there who think that nothing is worth anything until it's been aggregated, and they want to get all the answers from all the systems and dump them into one big answer. But that will lead you astray. As a researcher, you need to know what was seen together in certain time blobs by certain uh, groups of people. And if all you see is all the gravel in one truck instead of the rocks it came from, then you will be lost. Yeah, maybe I would like to add something about passive DNS, so it, it looks like an old technology that, you know, existing for ages and so on. But the thing that you, sh you should consider, and we have seen that we have some provider providing passive DNS, you should design even your own collections. Uh, we, ha we have seen uh, cases where, for example, when you collect, for example, passive DNS only from Tor exit node, for example, is giving a completely different view than from a normal use from an enterprise. Um, so, the thing that is very interesting here is um, passive DNS collection is something that we still not really standardized. We st just started to standardize basically the output format and some of the query, but we are still missing, for example, standardizing the technology behind. Um, so if you have more people building open source solutions or even software or services regarding passive DNS, um, you could build new tech new idea. And one of the ideas that we are working on right now is maybe to build an alternative OIS record from the passive DNS. A lot of information is basically in the uh, uh, record names that contain information about who to contact, 
even contact point, for example, in the uh, start of authority uh, part, you have such kind of information. So it's full of opportunities. So even if it has been invented in like 84, whatever, it's still useful. Um, so it's very interesting uh, on the long term for research and security research. And uh, I might want to add here as well, if you run a local, if you decide to have a local um, uh, server or a sensor um, in your organization, there's a really, really good uh, use case for that as well, which is, um, for example, you have a, a malware domain, a C2 domain. You just want to know if somebody in your organization resolved that. Uh, you can do that in many ways, but, you know, when... In what time frame? And so all these, all these questions can be answered. It's anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting. And, um, yeah, talk to, I think we can say talk to one of us to get, you know, going. I think all three of us represent systems that will give you API keys if you ask. Um, I will make sure you're not planning to make commercial use out of it because in that case I'd like you to pay. But if you have a non-commercial intent, I believe all three of us would give you a login. Just send us email. Um, but I think we should do some Q&A. Yep. So, okay, thank you for your talk. Um, for what you show, it seems pretty easy to find like... Um, malicious domains, <laughs> like uh, different regular expressions and so on. Um, is this actively being used uh, like for this? Uh, and what other uses apart from these are like out there? I know that when I use it, I was checking stuff off and pivoting and stuff. But like what are the main areas apart is like actively using this technology? Well, since I'm in sales, I'll tell you what we normally pitch, and that is if you are processing a syslog and you have one indicator, uh, probably the, the thing you most want to know is, is it related to other attacks? So if you pivot on that indicator and say, what does it have in common with other things, and uh, take the indicator up to the level of a uh, an attacker fingerprint, an asset cloud that gives you the fingerprint, it doesn't tell you their name, but if you see that fingerprint again, you'll know it's the same actor. Uh, that by itself uh, is probably the single most common use, is to actually use it in defense rather than in research. Maybe, you know, it's it's a really a Swiss army knife, so uh, it has multiple uh, use cases. Another uh, one would be, uh, for example, there's a malware domain. It was taken down, um, but uh, you got a report uh, that somebody in, in your network is infected. Uh, you, you don't have the uh, IP address anymore because the domain is down. Now you have it. Now you can look at your net flows, whatever. You can find the client, clean up, done. Yeah. So another one could be from actually from a uh, red team perspective. So when you're trying to analyze or understand a target for, for example, for pen testing and you're trying to collect uh, information or intelligence about some domain, you can, as I showed earlier, you can find the different subdomains that are available. And for uh, pen testers, that's actually a, <laughs> it's an asset, I'd say. Um, so that's another use case that's very, very different from the regular blue ones. So, anything else? Anyone? Else? Hi. Um, did you try using it for, for DNS poisoning detection? DNS poisoning detection? So, uh, yes, we can do that. Basically, what happens? So, another example that I haven't showed, and it's a very common use for passive DNS. But when you see, uh, um, for example, fast flux uh, domains. So fast flux domains are domains that change their IP on a very, very short TTLs. And then they have a few, maybe few domains or maybe few dozen domains that change their uh, IP ev almost every query you make. So it could be on a TTL of 60 seconds or maybe on a TTL of zero seconds. And then uh, every time you query it, you'll get a different domain and then uh, it's, sorry, a different IP and the domain will move. So it's very similar to uh, to uh, in, to this case. If I'm seeing multiple IP addresses, I can catch in a in a fast flux. Uh, I can catch a fast flux attack. But I could also see that I'm usually seeing one IP address, and suddenly I'm seeing a different one. And then why is that happening? So, for example, when uh, 
when uh, the traffic in Iran started, so when the Iranian government started uh, bending the traffic and reading emails, uh, you could have seen that in the passive DNS with a, in a sort of a way, because the IP changed on the resolutions. So. I remember a specific case, not really poisoning, but it was registrar uh, hijacking. Uh, I remember a case where we basically analyze a registrar that has been compromised and their uh, complete infrastructure were uh, taken over by the attackers. And the only way to figure out when exactly the attack started was not using their logs, but was to figure out when the first scene of the record they modified was basically used. So it was a very interesting uh, thing that to get, you get timestamp that was basically used for forensic uh, uh, analysis. Or, for example, you could imagine there you have a you're reversing something. You have a DGA algorithm. You find some domains in there. Just check, check where they're resolved. You know, where they're victims. Uh, I have a question for you, Paul. Because here, <laughs> hi. Um, we discussed yesterday with Aaron whether um, newly observed domains, as you noted, uh, are part of Farsight's uh, service uh, or pro commercial services. Um, can they actually be observed as part of passive DNS data because of, to some extent, that uh, crawlers at some point start also receiving the zone data? Uh, and uh, how much would that take? How long? So the database I've demonstrated today is what makes payroll and paid for my airplane ticket to come here. But it rests on a real-time foundation. Because you have to understand that a newly observed domain is only new for a short period of time. So uh, the database is essentially timeless. We have timestamps, uh, but it doesn't live in the now. If you want to live in the now, you don't want to, to have a query response system. You want a feed. And there is a feed called newly observed delegation points. Believe it or not, there are about three new things sold by somebody like GoDaddy to somebody like us every second. So it's about 150 to 200,000 of them per day. And then the longer names, not that you buy from GoDaddy, like example.com, but a longer name like www.example.com that you'd talk to a sysadmin and say, make that for me. We're seeing between 100 and 150 of those every second that we have not seen in the history of our database. So to do the type of uh, research I think we should be doing on these, because most of them are crap and they're created by people who hate us and want to steal our stuff, um, we need to be looking at that, finding the diacritical problems, finding the alphabet changes in the IDNs, finding com dash and saying that's got to, we need, got to put a person on that one because that's got our name and com dash and that's, uh, that, that's, uh, sort of double doom. Uh, that is all a real time thing and we have not set up any demonstrations for any of our real time systems. We've only, only shown you the databases today. So there are some nice metrics on that stream. I've been, so I wanted to actually talk with you about that. So let's just, we should, speak talk, more. We should talk more, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk on the stage, okay. Um, so I did, I did some, some metrics on, on that and, and some, um, you know, there's some nice, um, uh, how many characters have changed, Levenstein metric, etc., uh, on the, on the stream, which is quite interesting. So you can actually detect quick, quickly, let's say trademark, uh, that's, I, I don't like that example, but anyway, uh, typos of a domain, etc. You can detect that quite easy. I want to explain that although Aaron has his own database, he also has access to ours and to our real-time streams uh, by virtue of, uh, I guess, a blade or a VM or something that we've, we, we've uh, made available to him. Uh, and that is, to me, where all the cool stuff is. Uh, three items per second is the limit of human perception. If it's more than that, you're not going to read it. So if you leave a tail minus F running on that particular service, it will mesmerize you. Hi. Uh, would it be possible to run an additional example for another Luxembourg website, if it's possible? Yes, but not this tool. X and minus minus. <laughs> if you know the, uh, the the way to do it, yes. Just. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what we wanted. To, what? Oh God. No 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 no. I'm fine. <laughs> what have you got as an example? What can I look up? Um, maybe police uh, Luxembourg. 
Police Point Delu. That's well. It's it'll still have weird characters in it. I have a, I have an idea. What you can do? Go go for example to a different tab. Go to DNS Twister dot report. So a DNS Twister dot report is a, uh, a DNS Twist is an algorithm that allows you to look at. Uh, changes to domain names. It's uh, it's on GitHub, the original code, but there is this website that you can play with. So if you put the domain, so we said police.lu. So let's see what other domains are out there for police.lu. No, no, it's still thinking, I, I think. It's, 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 yeah. It's working on it. Okay, unfortunately, that's the only one apparently. But try, try for example, Microsoft.com, yeah. and that's that's a good example because you can Lots see the. Org is so small <laughs> that I want to find out what happens if we just do this. So we should be able to find. Um, let's see, we've seen a bunch of SOA changes. That's stupid. Let's let's look for the NS records instead. So as you might imagine, this uh, command line thing is what we all love to use, but this web thing is what the customers like. So, um, but there should be, ooh, mx.mx.mx, .mx .mx, what in the hell is going on there? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I remember I said that anything that has way too many domains, it's either that should not exist or someone wrote a bad script. So that the second option. So um, ideally, we should be able to see. Do you have IDN subdomains in .lu? Back to DNS Twister. It's your slot. What do you want now? <laughs> uh, just do new search and do Microsoft.com. Microsoft.com. So in Microsoft case, it's a little bit more popular for people to try and scam it. So there are a dozen domains registered with Microsoft A, Microsoft B, or Microsoft without the I, or uh, with addition, substitution, bit squatting would be changing a letter. Uh, sometimes you'll have stuff a, a little bit further. You'll have homoglyphs. That's what we're looking for. So for example, you have... Um, uh, oh, that's R, that's a current R and an N. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, but this one does not resolve, so it will not work. But if you look at the one below it, it oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so oh, you get okay. stuff that's actually in not a so Latin, uh, well, not yeah, English we'll letter, not ASCII letters. So it's uh, quite fun. So take take the one with the accent. Are you sure that my website is not going to do the right thing if I give it UTF-8? You, you should know better. <laughs> I would be happy to see it break. It's actually doing the right thing. It actually worked. Yeah. Amazing. So I, uh, I don't know how to do this in ASCII on the command line, but I know how to make the website do UTF-8. Um, so, um, yes, if you're doing this kind of thing, it works. But uh, frequently you don't want that because it's a pain in your butt. So um, if you go back, look at the same data without that option turned on. No, don't translate the page, you idiot. <laughs> then no, it will leave it, this it, even, raw XN stuff. Yeah, even Chrome does not believe it to be English, so. Well, uh, but just the same. Uh, this is what's on the wire, but since it can be represented as UTF, some tools will let you enter it that way or display it that way. And because of that, it will make people who do not pay a lot of attention click it. Um. Uh, I have another question here. So um, this is unrelated to uh, DNS, but you, you mentioned before that uh, as long as uh, no request has gone to any of your servers, you do not know about the domain, right? So um, 
I have talked to 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 it uh, to a few people here at Hacklu, uh, which is CT logs, certificate transparency logs. Now that um, certificates like TLS certificates are free from Let's Encrypt, uh, a lot of phishing sites are doing that. So you can actually like just by looking at at the streams of of new logs coming in, you can see new domains popping up before they actually have sent out any emails. So this might be something that that is interesting to uh, in to look at. Yeah, you have even some passive DNS collection that are basically just resolving everything in the uh, X509 certificate. So all the distinguished names, canonical names, and so on. Yeah, but that is only going to to catch all the ones that you've ever touched. So yeah. if, if you have touched one that has more than one common name then you're going to know about it. But if you use Let's Encrypt to have one certificate yeah, per sure. subdomain, you, yeah. you will never find it. One thing I want to add here is that this is essentially trying to be quiet. That's why the word passive is in the name. Um, we've had a number of different researchers say, oh, this newly observed domain feed is wonderful. I'm going to make a query of every name I see there every 24 hours to watch it change. And I'm thinking the bad guys are running the authority name servers, and I don't necessarily want them to know what I can see or what you can see. So, you, you know, passive really is a way of life. And the idea of a certificate transparency thing is strange because although it will expose a domain name, it won't tell you the content. You would have to make a query to learn it, which I won't do. And I've, we've been told to shut the hell up, by the way. You have. Uh, there's people queuing up to do their lightning talk, so... You can find these people around. You can ask them more stuff. You can do deals in the bar, I'm sure.